Hey, welcome back to the Road.TV Sermon Podcast. In today's episode, Pastor Matthew and Pastor Rick are going to sit down together and do a deep dive into the world of parenting, from navigating the tricky terrain of raising teens to building lifelong connections with adult children. They're answering your most pressing parenting questions. Tune in as they share wisdom, practical advice, and biblical insights on preparing your kids for the responsibilities of adulthood, finding balance in the busy lives, and helping children build strong relationships with God. Good morning. Hey, grab something to write with. We'll be referencing some scriptures you'll need to write down. We're taking a break from our Choose Your Heart series to talk parenting for two weeks. And speaking of Choose Your Heart. Hey, listen, thank you for being here. I know that as we've taken a break from our series, some of you are practically applying that by showing up today because I know that when we talk about parenting, we talk about kids, a lot of emotions can come to the surface. And so the fact that that you are here, maybe you've, you've wrestled with lately uh, infertility, maybe you've even had the death of a child. You continue to show up to encourage your faith family. Thank you for, for making it, it, being intentional and coming and encouraging us. We, we love our church family. It's a good word for us as well. we kind of jump in here and you know, we have eight pages of questions yeah. and, and there's very little that the Bible actually says about parenting. There's just a, a few direct passages of scripture. The Bible doesn't answer some of the questions you ask, like how do I help my teenager transition to adulthood or how do I get my adult child out of my house? Um, <laughs> doesn't, doesn't answer it. doesn't answer when do I give my child a cell phone. Uh, doesn't answer how do I help my child navigate changing morals Mm. in this world. Uh, The Bible talks a lot about how we live life, but there's a very specific reason that some of these issues aren't addressed. Uh, I have been asking young men, and I challenge you to do this. How do you define manhood? When is the moment that you are no longer a boy and you are now a man? And that's a really hard question to answer because um, in the life of a young girl, there's all these natural markers, right? Mm -hmm. If you ask a woman, when does your daughter become a a mom? When does your daughter become a woman? They've got an answer, a natural answer. That doesn't exist in the life of a man. And this changing culture that we're in has kind of redefined what all that looks like. And so we got guys 30 years old and they're going, I don't know what it means to be a man. I'm not figured this out. And if you're raising a 10-year-old, 12-year-old, 14-year-old, they're doing all kinds of crazy stuff trying to figure out what it means to be a man, right? Based on a, a cultural definition. That wasn't a problem in Hebrew culture. Hebrew culture revolved around, listen to this, a shared value and belief system. If you lived in that culture, you shared these values and these beliefs. Yeah. So you answer the question, When does a man become a boy? Easy answer. It is bar mitzvah. They look at him and go, from this point forward, you break a law. 13. 13, what did I say? Bar mitzvah. A bar mitzvah. 13 years old. Just making it clear. Yeah, 13. 13 years old. You break a law, you do the time. Mom and daddy ain't bailing you out. Nothing you can do. You're a grown man with grown man responsibilities. Same thing for a girl. In that culture, everyone knew what it was to be a man. What it was to be a woman. Matter of fact, listen to this. This is Deuteronomy 21. Because one of the questions we got asked was about like kids that back talk and don't obey and all that. Listen to this. If any man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey his father or mother, and when they chastise him, he won't even listen to them. Then his father and mother are, shall, shall seize him, bring him out to the elders of the city at the gateway of his hometown. And they shall say to the elders of the city, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey us. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men, all the men of the city shall stone him to death. That's a deterrent, right? (laughs) Listen to what it says. So you shall remove the evil from your midst. And all Israel will hear of it and fear it. So, So my question is this. Did anybody ever get stoned? Because the thought of being stoned is enough to keep you from back talking mama. (laughs) <laughs> right? Are you with me? Is it only takes that kid smart mouth once and daddy looks at him and says, let me tell you the story of Jimmy who smart mouthed his mama and they drug him outside the city. And he goes, you're kidding me. No, I can take you and show you the spot where Jimmy got stoned to death. Is that what you're looking for? Because that's what our community of faith believes. Wow. Yeah. We work together, right? Now, that's an extreme. I'm not telling you to go stone a kid. Please don't. don't. Please don't. We do not hold to that, right? 
Uh, I'm just telling you that there is power in community of faith. Yeah, yeah. And what you are missing from your life is a community of people who share the same beliefs and values. Wow. Watch this. Wow. Listen carefully what I'm going to tell you. Your kids are going to go to a school and they do not share your belief system yeah. nor your value system. They're going to spend more time at that school than they do with you. Wow. And they do not share your belief system nor your value system. They're going to play on a ball team. And that ball team will not share your belief system or value system. They're going to have a next door neighbor who lives by you. Wow. And they will not share your belief system or your value system. So because we don't exist in the culture that the Hebrews did, we have to choose community. Wow, that's good. Community of people mm-hmm. who have a shared value and belief system. And there's one more thing. My iPad won't open. There we go. Um, we choose to create the culture. Don't just live with whatever crosses your path. Right, don't just go, okay, just whatever whatever school, right? And I know we got a lot of parents being proactive that are relocating their homes to be in a different school system because of what that school system represents or what the one they were in represents or they're making the choice to go to Christian schools or homeschool. They're looking, they're seeking that community of faith. But our verse that we're going to springboard off of is is Matthew 6.33. It's not a parenting verse. It's a follow Jesus verse. Hmm. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will fall in place. That's really good. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for our time. I pray that you would uh, use the, the wisdom of Matthew and, uh, Father, the work that we've done to, to help our people do a good job of parenting. Uh, we pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So we start with a question, and we've got about five of them, uh, of adult children. And this is the first question. How do I parent my adult child whose lifestyle I do not agree with? Um, talk about the, the some. So one of the things, I don't know if you guys remember, a couple of years ago, we brought in a guy. His name was uh, Jimmy Jimmy Scroggins, okay? And he came in and he did kind of a, a weekend of sort, but he wrote a book and, and we shared it then. I'll share it with you again now. It's called Full Circle Parenting. Full Circle Parenting. And, and the whole, the book's premise, the whole concept is, how do I continue to drive the conversation with my kids back to the gospel? Okay? So listen to what he said in the book, but he talked about it when he was here with us. I thought it was really, really good. Is He was talking about his oldest son, who was a very rebellious child. And as he was talking about his son, and his rebellious kid, and one of the things that he said I thought was really good is that um, they continued to pray and, ha- and wish and hope for their kid, but, but it was kind of like a fleeting thing. And so they began to find comfort in the Ascent Psalms in Scripture, okay, the Ascent Psalms in Scripture. One, particularly Psalm 130, verses 6 and 7, they continue to look to. And in that Psalm, listen to what it says. It's the, the writer is writing and saying, like um, watchmen w- watching on the wall, okay? More than watchmen on the wall. And the picture is you've got this kingdom, you've got this wall, and on the top of the wall at night, you've got these guards that are standing watch, ensuring that there's not enemies coming to attack. More than the watchmen on the wall, the, the, I will place my faith and my hope in Jesus. And so the concept that really he lifted out that I thought was just so strong was that in, it's, it's easy as parents to begin to find our hope in our kids, right? I hope my kids are going to do well, or even our, we, our faith in our kids. I, I, I really am hoping, I'm, I'm looking for them to do well, but that's a fleeting thought. What is always a strength and a foundation that we can stand on is not what our kids are going to do, but the redemptive plan, the consistent redemptive plan of Jesus Christ. So we may not can hope in our kid, but we can always hope in the Lord because our kids won't always do what we ask them to do or what we think they should do, but Jesus will always come through. Follow through. Yeah. yeah. You know, now I've got six kids. I'll be the first to tell you my kids have made decisions of where they rebelled against the Lord. And I'm going to tell you, if, if yeah. your kids really rebel, they'll dash your hope in them against the rocks. Wow. They'll live in a life where you'll look at it and go, there is no hope. Place your hope in the faithfulness of Jesus, yes. not in the abilities of your children. That's good. That's is really it God good. loves our children, right? Does he love them more than we do? Yes. I, I need somebody other than Matthew to agree with us today. <laughs> Does Jesus love your children more than you do? Yes. Then believe him. Yeah, believe that's him. Really good. So watch. This is how it works because if you're in the throes of it right now and you're pulling your hair out because your kids are, it's just a mess, right? It's just a mess. So if that's where you're living, your role as a parent is constantly changing. 
And we talk about four roles here, the commander, the coach, the counselor, and the and consultant. They're constantly changing. Your job changes. It shifts as your children mature. God's never changes. God's role never changes. Never, never, never. So you leave him to do what he has always done. So when your child becomes an adult, lifestyle belongs to God. That's right. Lifestyle belongs to God. You are now free. You don't have to preach another message, quote another scripture, right? You don't have to write another ugly letter. You don't have to do any of those things, right? You're free. Free to do what? Love them. Love them. Pray hard. Yes. That God will do the work that God, Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, for it is God who is at work in you. Both to will and to work for his good pleasure. That's where we place our faith. That promise of scripture. Start praying that for your adult kid. Man, get, they made that decision. Do not, God, work your will and your way in their life. And I, I depend on you. My faith is in you and your ability and your love for them as God. That's really good. Hey, let's uh, start talking about teens. You want to do yeah, that? Sure. So, hey, before we ask, start answering the questions, let me kind of set this stage this mindset. There's a guy named Aaron Wren, and I met uh, him a couple weeks ago and, and had a conversation with him even after that. And he writes about these three taxonomies for understanding culture. And so taxonom- taxonomy is just a basic idea, a, con- a concept, okay? And he writes so that we can begin to understand the culture in which we live in now. And he says there's three cultures that the world has lived in and its relationship to the church. Three different worlds, views, if you could say, that are, 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 the Here world has lived Right now in your notes, draw three circles. And he's going to give you the label for each circle. Just draw them across, and it's going to help you understand this. Okay. Uh, the one circle is positive. The middle circle, let's say, is neutral. And then the other cir- circle is negative. Okay, so here's what I want you to understand. Uh, Pre-1994, that's the positive circle. Pre-1994, positive meaning the world believes that the church has the answers to the questions that they're asking. Okay, that's pre-1994. And pre-1994, people believed that not only was the church right, but they were answering the right questions. Okay, pre-1994. 1994 to 2014 is neutral world, if you will. And in other words, the world is saying, hey, I'm not anti the church. I'm not anti Jesus, but I'm not sure that the church has the right answers to the questions I'm asking. In other words, there's a, a doubt that's beginning to creep in in the validity of Scripture and the authority of Jesus. Does that make sense what I'm saying to you? So again, you went from positive you to, to neutral, and now you and from neutral, that's a very quick, slippery slope. 2014 to present, present is negative world. In other words, the world does not believe that the church is not, only, it's not only answering the right questions, but the church doesn't have an answer, period, to the questions that they're asking about you name it. Almost becomes adversarial. Right. And so this is what's interesting as we were talking to, as I was talking to uh, Aaron Rand. So how about this? I grew up in North Carolina, okay? And in North Carolina, our greatest fear was that, and what we were always told, in 10 years, the, the liberal culture of the West Coast is actually going to creep into the Bible Belt culture in, in the East. Does that make sense? I don't know if you've ever heard things like that before. I mean, again, when I was a kid, it was like 10 years, what's happening in L.A. is going to happen here, okay? I asked Rick, I said, have you ever heard anything like that? He's like, yeah, I was always told it was 40. 40 years. And so I asked Aaron Rand, I said, hey, because of these different worlds, where are we? How far are we actually away from, from the most liberal places in the world? How far away are we from, from, from that here? And he said, three to four years. Because of the social media, internet, our neighbor is not really our neighbor anymore. Our neighbor is who we connected to online. And because of that fact, now the, the, some of our greatest fears are not 10 years away. They're actually happening right now. So need to, need to understand, look right up here at me. Your kid can't afford to live where you live if you're here today. Right, your 18's not going to buy a house out here in eastern Oklahoma County. Not jocked all. Yeah, so where are they going to go? They're going to go somewhere where the culture is different, and your job is to teach them how to survive in that culture. So get this, look right here at me. This I'm talking to my 30s. If you were born in 1994, the very end of, I believe what the church says is true and right for my life and has the answers. Your children, you're now raising children, you're there. Your children are now being born into a culture that is negative toward the church and believes the church has nothing to offer for them. You can't even talk to them. What they believe about this world and about church is so different. And that's where you get into these things where your kids come home and they go, I can't believe they believe that. I can't believe they said that. I can't believe they're doing that. It's because they don't hold the value system that you hold. And now, so you got positive, neutral, neutral. And negative, you can't jump from negative to positive, right? You got you got to go through all three circles. 
This is what's really good. Take it. So this is where, you know, when we're thinking about just, let's say, salvation in general, wh- whose job is to, to get someone saved? The Holy Spirit. Okay? So to, go from neg- so to go from negative to neutral is not your job. That's the Spirit's job. Your job is, is to love. He said you're free to love. Is to love, to model, to care, to, 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 to basically show them that Jesus is the answer through your life. And so when we're thinking through this, this is what we have to realize is not only, and I love what he said, is that our kids probably won't live here, is that we have to begin to live intentionally to train up our kids to live in a world that we may personally not live in. It's a different thing. And so how are we doing? What are you doing to prepare your kids to live, listen, not next to you? So, So make sure you understand it. If they're living in a negative world today and you're throwing scripture at them, all you're doing is creating a fight. Yeah. If they're living in a negative world... If you're preaching a sermon to them, if you're sending them, Brother Rick, preach this message, it's so good, <laughs> right? All you're doing is creating a fight because it, God has to do the work of moving from negative to neutral. That's good. That's conviction. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. Our job in this world is to move people from neutral into positive. Hey, God may be the answer. All right, now we're on the page where we can start working. That's called evangelism. Make sure you get that. Love the people in negative world, evangelize the people in neutral world. Which is also our intentionality because would we not want to put our kids around people that's going to also show them and model so they can get to positive world and not keep our kids around those wrong people that's going to draw them further back into negative. So the, one of the questions that we just bled into is how do I help my teen transition out of teenage years into adulthood? Uh, that should have been happening for a really, really, really long time. Uh, if you're just now asking that question about your 18-year-old, it's, it's late. It's really late. But let me tell you, show you a picture again of our world. In 1940, 17-year-olds made the decision to give their life defending this country in a world across an ocean. Most of them had never been off a farm. Mm. And they'd get on a boat and go, or a plane and go across the world to die at 17. Today, biggest decision a 17-year-old has made, which, which Xbox game they're going to play. <laughs> Who did that? Wow. We did it. Right. We removed all responsibility from the lives of our children and made it hard for them to become adults. Mm-hmm. Right. So uh, I get I'm, I'm, my wife passes away. I got three kids are playing everything in the world. I'm dying. Hardest job I ever did with a single parent. If you're a single parent here, I love you. I will pray for you today. If you'll come tell me. Hardest job I ever did. I meet the woman who would become my wife and she says, hey, can I ask you a question? She said, why are you washing your kids clothes? She says, they're big enough to play sports. They're big enough to wash their own clothes. <laughs> and I'm, I was like, and I literally looked at her and I said, you're the smartest woman I've ever met. <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding. There was a multitude of things that she brought to my life where I would look at her and go, you're the smartest woman I've ever met. And then said, I think I need to wife you up. <laughs> um, <laughs> so so, so <laughs> what, what, here's the deal. <laughs> My son, her son, my stepson sitting on the front row today. So um, here, here, here's, here's the deal. If you're going to send your kid to college and they've never washed a load of clothes in their life, yeah. don't be surprised if they go to college and live like a child. Or look for a mama. Look for a mama at college. Right? That's on us. We haven't taught our children yeah. how to manage That's money. Really we haven't taught our children how to do basic life. And, and, and we keep saying, oh, but they're just 18. So this is what will really scare you. Keep that in your mind. They're just 18. Pew Research, 2024 statistics. 57% of young adults between 18 and 24 are going to live with mom and daddy. You got two, one of them staying. I'm going to scare you to death now. I'm going to scare you to death. Hang on. 33% of 19 to 34s. You got three? You're going to be retired before they get out of the house, right? Thirty, A third of all young adults, 19 to 34, still live at home with mom and dad. Tell me the biggest reason they're still living at home. Can't afford to get out. Look, look at me. Make sure you get the big picture of this. We talk about spiritual warfare and things going on. We have created a culture where young people cannot define themselves as adults by the definition our culture has given them. So we better get busy looking at Scripture and say, what does a biblical man look like and what does a biblical woman look like? And it has nothing to do with where you live. Because that stuff's not going to change. 
right? And we got young people that feel stuck in this world that I can't be a man. I can't be a woman because I still live with mom and daddy. Hmm. How about redefining that? Mm-hmm. Anyway, sorry for the sermon. Uh, third, third thing, parenting issues. Yeah. So, hey, here's a question. How do I find time for everything? Can't do it. Yeah. Right. I, and they're sitting here, so they love me, I hope. Um, I have spent the last couple of weeks uh, watching four-year-old T-ball. Okay? And it is the most frustrating thing in the world to go watch. <laughs> it is the most frustrating. And they, they're shaking their heads. And, and here's my question. What four-year-old wants to be out there? Right? Did a four-year-old wake up and go, I got to be on a team? <laughs> right? No, no. We, we push that stuff and, and, and we try to do, we don't want our kids to miss anything, any experience. And so we try to push to keep them super active. Tell them what, what that guy told you yeah, in the so interview. We've been reading a book and, and it's by this, uh, uh, and a pastor, his, his sons are pastors. Matter of fact, one of his sons is the pastor of the, one of the largest churches in the United States. And so I called them. It was last week, mm-hmm. last week. And I said, hey, listen, I just want to know, because you've clearly done a, a, a decent job of parenting and raising your kids. What did you do? What would you say is the one thing that's really got you to the place where your kids are really just, they're dynamically living for the Lord. And not only are they living, strong, like they, they're making some major waves, right, in the kingdom. And he said, we limited what they could do. We did not do, how about this? We didn't do everything. And so, you know, that would be my question is why, why do you need to do everything? If someone, if, if you're really thinking, well, how do we do all this? Well, why, why would you need to the, the, I would just simply say, and we're going to, we can kind of build on this as well, is that the best thing you can do for your, your child is actually work on your marriage. So if you don't do anything, why don't you just do the one thing that you need to do, which is actually set a firm foundation model for, for your children, what it looks like for a healthy Marriage statistics show that if you'll actually take care of your relationship as a as a married couple, then your kids will actually be okay. So listen to the the statistics. There's a two percent chance that if you're an NCAA athlete that you'll ever set foot on a pro field. Two percent. There's a two percent chance if you're a high school athlete that you'll ever go to college and have a scholarship, have any scholarship money. Two percent chance. So are you work, working really hard for that? Wow. Because if you are, make sure you understand what I'm saying. It's very unlikely that your kid's going to get it. Because very few kids do. But on the other hand, 50% of kids are going to marry. 100% of them need a job. Are you getting ready for that? And listen to this. 100% of them will die. Wow. They will die. And it's going to be a lot more important at that moment in life that they know Jesus and have followed him than they knew how to throw a curveball. Well, it brings us back to our intentionality, right? And and again, what are we being intentional in doing? How are we discipling our kids? What are we showing them by our lives? Because if we're pushing the wrong thing on our children, if we're leading them down the wrong path, then we will blow it in the end for our kids. And it's not that there's, there is grace, right? And and God gives us an opportunity and thankfully our kids probably end up better than, than some of us deserve for them to end up. Okay. But, but listen, but, but we can be intentional in creating the right foundation so that we're giving all the chance in the world for our kids to succeed in Jesus. Real quick, because uh, in the weightiness of this, this is a pretty easy question. How do I parent my kids fairly? You don't. <laughs> uh, most of us consider fair as equal. That's right. And and you're, because your two-year-old needs a nap doesn't mean your 10-year-old needs a nap. That's equal, right? Uh, fair means you give them what's appropriate for their age and maturity, right? What's appropriate for that. This is one of the things, again, my wife had to work on me from. For my oldest kid say, I need $10. And I'd go, every kid needs $10. Fair. Got to be fair. Mm-hmm. Can't not be fair. And she looked at me and she goes, listen, don't you understand that when the next oldest kid gets to that point in life, they're going to need $10. And what's fair is to, to be there for what they need at that point in time in life based on age and maturity. Super answer, because what you have for the next one is more weighty than this. Let's jump to the last question. Well, let me just say this before we do it. So, we got five kids, my wife and I, right? And so we have these 
13 to 6, and ultimately when we're looking at our kids, we're trying to decide how do we parent them. And again, this fair thing of equality doesn't really work when you got five kids and a, and a limited budget, okay? So as we're thinking through our kids, we've really created and set boundaries. We could even say markers that once you get to this place, this is now some of the, the realm of opportunity that opens up for you. And if you're 13, this is what happens. But you're not going to get these opportunities when you're six, Okay, and we talk about it even from relation of earrings for our girls. I'm just going to be honest with you. And it's not that we're anti earrings, but we are more for teaching our kids that their that their value is not in looks, but in Jesus and who they are in Christ. Is it cell phones? Right. Again, I I have people come up to me all the time saying, well, how do you let your kids go to someone's house without a cell phone? Listen to me. We don't let our kids go to anyone's house that we don't trust the character and integrity of the adults that are there. Okay. And I'm not saying we do it right all the time. I'm just saying is that we have to be thinking about our children and discipling our, our kids to, to be able to deal with the maturity level that they're at. And then if we're not careful, we will really blow that and mess that all. I, I love that picture of you're having a conversation with your kid. Now you're going to Jimmy's house and if, if something starts happening, you call me. What? Well, when did we get, start parenting like I'm sending you into the danger zone here's your cell phone get me out call me if you need me no no great picture yeah hey let's children how to how to build a strong relationship that lasts into adulthood and also this uh focus on the lord we're going to kind of do two of them once here's the here's the thing parenting's tough that's why you're here today it's hard it's really hard most of us have stories of how our parents blew it they have stories of how their parents blew it that's just the way life is it's really really difficult to be a good parent but if you confuse friendship and parenting, you're in a mess. Yeah. Uh, do the work of parenting for 20 years and have a friend for the next 40. That's good. But if you neglect the, the, the role of parenting for the first 20, you'll be doing it for the next 60. Right? Later is longer. Do the work on the front end. You know, one of the things that we've looked to, Allison and myself, and just kind of re- looking at raising our kids, and is Andy Stanley has a podcast that they do, he and his wife, and and I don't, I don't follow all the things of Andy, just to be clear, but he does say this, is be, that, be the home, create the environment that your kids would always want to come back to. So what does that look like? Right? Well, it looks like, I can just tell you, fun and order. Uh, we read in uh, Corinthians that our God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. And if there's order, there is peace. And if there's fun and excitement and order, listen to me, when, when life gets crazy, our kids grow up, they get married, they start having kids, they got a job. When all the stressors of life are happening, where would they want to go? Not back to a house with more stress, but listen, to an environment where they can find peace and fun. That's church too, brother. That same principle tra- applies right here. That's good. People don't want to come to a church in the midst of chaos and fighting. They won't come to church with peace. They won't come to home with peace. That's good. Talk about relationship with God. How do you grow, grow in that? So, you know, from an old man looking back, and especially from the position of a pastor who, whatever reason, thought he was the guru of all things spiritual. Um, <laughs> you are. My ch- children were small, and we were trying to do family devotions, and it looked like a church service, and everybody was miserable. <laughs> uh, because I was trying to dispense knowledge and not growth. Wow. And so, uh, you know, I had a little come to Jesus meeting with my wife of like, you're not the guru here. Uh, you're the regular guy here. And we know all your junk and, and what that looks like in your life. So let's just calm this thing down. And so, you know, if you've got a, a three-year-old or four-year-old and you're trying to do 20 minutes of a family devotion, you are treading water. <laughs> uh, they're bored out of their mind. That's what they're out yeah, Go Go for two. Yeah, that's good. And, and, and have a central truth. And we're writing material for 2026. It's going to have a central truth every day for your time with your kids. We're writing it. We're producing it in-house for us. It's going to be around the stories of Scripture. But every day we'll have a central truth for your kids. That's what you're looking for. You want them to walk away and go, I know God loves me. Right? Simple truth, but you want it buried deep in their life. Let me, let me share with you something I got, and then I'll wrap it up, and we'll let Rick close this out. I wrote this down in my notes. I, I would just encourage you with this mindset. Biblical community. And biblical competence is the foundation for living a biblical life, okay? Biblical community, the people that you have around you, right? The people that you place in your kids, biblical community and biblical competence. They can't, they can't act according to God's word if they don't know it, okay? Biblical community, the people, biblical, biblical competence, the knowledge of scripture is the foundation for living a Christian life. I wrote down a very simple framework that I want to give you as it's related to raising your children. Here it is. Build wise... Okay, correct foolish and drive away evil. Build wise, 
correct foolish, drive away evil. Set the right priorities for your children. If you want them to learn to pray, then teach them to pray. How about this discipleship? Build wise, okay? Correct foolish. What does that mean? Well, it's, it may be cute when your five-year-old five, year, five year old has a smart mouth, but it's not cute when your 17-year-old has a smart mouth, okay? Correct foolish and then drive away evil. We talked about this last week. If evil, if sin is evil and evil is really working to seek, kill, and destroy, why would you even ever give the thought of allowing evil to have a foothold in your home if you can help it? Why would you not set up an environment and a boundary that's literally keeping the very thing that's trying to kill the unity within your house away? Let me say this and we'll, I'll toss it back to you. So picture, if you will, how many of you have kids? A lot of you do. Um, I'll never forget when Alice and I, we had Max, we were living in Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, so I, you know, it was time for us to leave. The, the nurse told me, go, go get the car, pull up at the curb. I'm going to bring Allison down and the baby down. Okay. And so I pull up in, in my old Explorer at the time. And uh, Allison was sitting there in, the, in a wheelchair. Our baby was in the car seat. I helped Allison get in the front seat. And do you remember where the baby goes? Do you know? In the back seat. In the back seat. What, what a great picture of what life is supposed to be like in the house. The baby goes in. Listen to me. Your children go in the back seat. They're not, they're not drivers. They're along for the ride. And what happens often, is, because we love our kids so much, is that when our kids begin to cry out and scream, and, is that we, if we're not careful, we will allow our children to detour us, distract us, get us off of the very direction that we set out for our family to begin with. And let me just say this to you. Your kids are not leaders. They're learners while they're in your household. Model, teach, show them, put them around the right people. And as you are leading your house, as you're driving the car, listen, you can love your kids best by simply you staying in control of where the car is going. I looked this up. I Google searched it. Backseat drivers, the very first question that comes up with backseat drivers is, is it okay to have backseat drivers? And this is what the answer says, is that a backseat driver is not only creates problems for the driver, but creates problems for themselves because ultimately you're going to end up in a wreck. You're in a wreck. Right? Ultimately you end up in a wreck. What a great picture to wrap up on. So we're going to wrap up differently today. Uh, if you're here with your family, we're going to ask you to pray together. Uh, whatever your family looks like, single mom, single dad, I will tell you this. If you're a single mom or single dad, I'd love to pray with you. It was the hardest thing I ever did. And I'd love to pray with you if, you, if you'd like that. Uh, but we're going to ask you to turn and just pray with each other. Uh, our ministers will be here at the front. If you desire prayer for your family from one of our ministers, step out at that time. Uh, everybody here has got somebody. If you came alone, you got somebody you can be praying for. Grandkids. Grown kids, whatever that looks like. So uh, if you would, bow your heads with me. Father, thank you so much um, for the time and for the opportunity to do this, Father. This is uh, it's different, and, and yet we're very grateful for the, to be the church that lets us do it. I, I pray for moms and dads today. I pray for dads who are, uh, Father, maybe um, realize some things in their home need to change, that you'd give them the strength to just reach over and, Father, grab their wife's hand and say a silent prayer with them today. Um, Father, for homes that are broken, Father, I pray that there would be healing today. God, I thank you in advance for what you're going to do in this moment and I ask it in the name of Jesus. Hey, thank you for tuning in to today's message. If you found it encouraging, please consider sharing it with someone who may also need to hear it. For questions or prayer requests, feel free to email us at connect at the road.tv. For more information about The Road, visit us on Facebook at facebook.com slash the road CRBC or check out our website, the road.tv. Hey, thanks for being with us and may you have a blessed day.